Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Thanks for spending some time with us today. One brief reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player and a legendary DJ. Watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Well, for decades, Jewish families have relied on slow cookers to achieve the soft, flavor-filled stews of their ancestors, but lamented how much time is required. That's why Jewish food and the Instant Pot are a natural fit, and why chef and author Paula Scheuer has written the first Instant Pot cookbook to feature kosher food. Scheuer, also known as The Kosher Baker, joins me today to talk about her new book, The Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook, 100 Recipes to Nourish Body and Soul. A French-trained pastry chef, Scheuer teaches cooking and baking classes all over the world, more than 170, regularly appearing in media such as The Washington Post and Food 52. Scheuer has appeared on television nearly 50 times, including on programs like NBC Washington and San Diego Living, and has competed on Food Network's Sweet Genius. She's also the author of several other Jewish cookbooks, including The Healthy Jewish Kitchen, The Holiday Kosher Baker, The Kosher Baker, and The New Passover Menu. Welcome back, Paula. Great to have you with us. Hi, Dan. It is great to be with you. If only we could be together in person sharing something delicious. Well, that'll be next time. But first things first, uh, we're here to talk about the new cookbook, the Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook, 100 Recipes to Nourish Body and Soul. So, of course, the first obvious question is, why did you write the Instant Pot Cookbook? And more important and more relevant, perhaps, to the time, did the pandemic play a role in why you wrote the book, especially with so many kosher cooks stuck at home these past 15 months? What inspired you the most? So I was a little bit late to the Instant Pot game. I had heard about it. Fans of my other cookbooks kept asking me for Instant Pot versions of my recipes. And I kept telling them, I I don't have an Instant Pot. But I finally gave in and I got an Instant Pot and I used it three times. I made split pea soup and marveled how the split peas melted into the liquid in a very short amount of time. I made short ribs flunk in in 35 minutes, falling off the bone moist compared to an hour and a half or longer in the oven. And I made rice and I thought, this is genius. And then somebody told me that there was a kosher Instant Pot Facebook group. So I went on the Facebook group and joined. And at the time there were 8,700 members. and I was really impressed. And I thought that would be a great resource of recipes. And it was. But what I saw was frustration among the members that others would post recipes that still had to be adapted kosher. And I realized, you know what? I should write a cookbook for this community. And this Kosher Instant Pot Facebook group is now about 15,000 strong. And But when I wrote, I wrote a proposal to write this book, I had only used it a few times. So I joked that sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. And I went from zero to expert, so anyone can. So why do you think a cookbook focused on Instant Pot recipes instead of, say, vegetables or Israeli-themed food, which is very popular now, or even something like a barbecue theme, you know, we're here in uh, entering summer, resonates uh, with Jewish cooks? And in this context, do you think that a kosher cooking differs much from non-kosher cooking when we're talking about the basics. Well, what I discovered is so many of the dishes that we truly love in our culture, the the briskets and the soups come out fast. It's faster, easier, and the flavors are really rich. So I, you know, when I was testing recipes like the stuffed cabbage, the kasha, all that stuff came out so, so good. I have lots of Israeli recipes in the book. Chicken shawarma is probably one of my favorite recipes in the book because it's just so, so simple and really fast. And I think for people who were used to using the slow cooker and 
it took a really long time for things to cook. You get that same flavor, but in a shorter amount of time. Plus, on the on the Instant Pot brand model, it has a saute feature. So you can actually brown the chicken and brown the meat and brown the aromatics for soup before putting in your other ingredients and letting them cook. The other reason I think it's really great for, for Jewish people is that it makes it makes a really good amount of food. So like I can make soup for, you know, 10 people in my eight quart instant pot. And I find the cleanup so easy. Plus, once you put everything in the pot and seal the lid, you can walk away. You don't have to stand over that pot of soup. And is it simmering? Is it boiling too much? Do I have to skim it? Do I have, when do I add this or that? It's, you're done. You can get back to work. You can play with your kids, hang out with your mom, to, you know, go exercise and the food will just cook away. So it's more hands off. And plus, you know, a kosher kitchen is a very congested place, which is one of the reasons I resisted getting yet another appliance for so long, but it replaces so many pots and pans. So for my four children in their twenties in small apartments, the Instant Pot replaces a, a pot you would use for rice, a, a pot you might use for pasta, sauce, soup, so you don't have to store as many different pots and pans. This device will replace so many of them. Now, in your book, uh, you include 46 kosher for Passover recipes, uh, even some vegetarian, vegan, and gluten-free options. So there's something there for everyone. Why the emphasis on the Passover dish? You know, it's just coincidental that there are that many Passover recipes. I tend to be somebody who likes to cook with natural ingredients. My Healthy Jewish Kitchen cookbook was all using natural ingredients. I didn't use jarred sauces and puff pastry and mayonnaise. I used none of those ingredients. So for me, my go-to in developing recipes is always going to be like the proteins and the vegetables. I'm not looking to use a lot of jarred products that you couldn't even use on Passover. So, so many of my recipes are naturally gluten-free, so they become Passover-friendly recipes. and yeah, I wanted a book that people could use all year round. As it turns out, the book had been delayed due to multiple COVID-related delays, and it came out right before Passover. So there was, it just happened to have a lot of great recipes for Passover. What's your favorite kosher for Passover dish? Oh, that's a, t you know, that's a hard one. I mean, we eat matzah bowls all year round. So I even have matzah, matzah, fry in the recipe, but I don't have, um, which was really a funny thing for me to do. And I don't even like matzo bry. What's my favorite Passover dish that's just on Passover? It's probably not necessarily, yeah, that's a tough one because I put my favorites in here. I even have sponge, I have sponge cake in here. I have various salads. I have, uh, you know, flavored matzo balls, um, brisket. Brisket comes out so moist. You just have to cut the pieces in half to stack them up in the pot. What's the key to matzo bry? Uh, you can eat it all year round. I suppose we, we kind of devour it <clears throat> on the eight days, but it, it's, it's pretty good. But everybody seems to have their own take. Some, some like it sweet, some people don't. What's the secret to, to a good matzo bry? You just said the secret. The secret is making it the way that you like it, right? So one of the things I discovered with Instant Pot baking was that anything you could bake in an oven where you would steam it. So like a flourless chocolate cake and cheesecakes, like a water bath it comes out great in the Instant Pot. So you put water at the bottom of the pot, it comes with a steam rack and you put a pan on top. I make potato kugel, noodle kugel in the Instant Pot the same way. So I have my matzo bry in a pan. So it kind of cooks in the way steams in the device. And then I take it out and put it in the oven. And, I'm, and on my version, I put sugar on top and brulee it like creme brulee. So it's kind of savory inside, but then it has a sugar top. So that was my way to kind of reach out to both the sweet and savory audiences. Well, we spoke uh, about a year ago uh, near the beginning of the pandemic. And I know you're normally on the road doing cooking events <clears throat> for Jewish institutions. Uh, but COVID has grounded most of us. Uh, for now going on the past uh, 16 months, beginning to come out of that now. So I'll ask a question you, you've probably heard before, uh, but is nonetheless relevant. What have you concentrated on while we've all been at home? And has the pandemic changed the way you approach cooking? You've written all of the cookbooks, but being home for all this time, you've had a chance perhaps to experiment with this or take another look at that. Uh, how, how has um, 
your life changed uh, uh, in the world of cooking over, over this past year and a half, almost a year and a half? Well, Passover 2020, I was asked to do my first virtual cooking class and that slowly exploded. So the number you mentioned at the beginning, 170, is just the virtual classes I've taught in the last 15 months or so. And if you had told me, you know, two years ago, oh, virtual cooking classes was gonna be your primary business, I would have laughed at you. But I started doing virtual cooking classes for organizations. I've done them for audiences from six people to 600 across multiple time zones. So for a book tour, it's kind of cool because people can log in from anywhere. When I do an event now for a synagogue in New Jersey, People from Canada can join, people from Texas, anywhere. So that's been really great. And I did 10 sessions of summer camp last summer with teenagers cooking and baking with me. And that morphed into my series on after school cooking classes. So teenagers would finish their Zoom school day, get on with me at 4.30 and cook dinner for their families. And it was so successful because these teens would learn how to use the tools and equipment in their own kitchens and learned how to like finish a day and get a meal on the table. So that was great. So I believe that virtual will continue. And because of that, I was able to launch a book during this time, which was great. Now, for me personally, I had my four adult children home for a, a huge chunk of 2020. And to keep everyone's morale up, we started this tradition every Sunday where we would make a themed brunch. Greek food, British high tea, Cuban, Swiss, Southern American, Italian, it just from all over the world. And we would all research recipes. We would, the, we use this hashtag brunch like a shoyer. Uh, my Instagram is at kosher baker. And so we would document it every week. And I got to try so many new recipes. I discovered certain things, which is that not all recipes you find online are the same. So cookbook recipes really are so much more reliable, I find, than what I find online because it really is a wild west out there. And so that was something that I learned. But I started, I learned how to perfect homemade pasta. My sourdough became a regular occurrence. So I started making sourdough. One of my favorite creations last year is my challah focaccia, where I take long braids of challah and I bake them in a half sheet pan filled with some olive oil and you kind of pull it apart so you've got this crispy crunchy olive oil bottom and the nice sweet dough on top so that was one of my favorite creations during this time but I also continued to create new instant pot recipes and some of those are on the kosherbaker.com so I definitely took the opportunity to cook and bake more you know, now that I'm going back to restaurants, I have way less patience for food not being prepared the way I like it because I'm so used to making everything exactly to my own taste. Everything I eat is made and it comes right to the table hot. Restaurants kind of stagger when the plates come to the table. So it, it's taking me time to adjust back to that. Homemade food is really delicious. And you there's no end of your imagination and, and what you can explore you really can like travel the world from your kitchen table. Are there uh, vegetables or seasoning, perhaps spices that are trending now in uh, kosher cooking or cooking generally? I think the Middle Eastern trend is still with us and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. People love those flavors. I have Moroccan recipes in my book, you know, lots of Israeli ones too. People really like the, that combination of spices. The, the cumin, the turmeric, harissa is, is still extremely popular, which is nice. Um, I'll play around with ras el hanout, which, which is a, you know, another Middle Eastern spice mix. And I think those flavors are going to continue to stay with us because it comes in tandem with cooking from scratch, you know, farm to table, fresh vegetable dishes, which is... Um, the reason why the Mediterranean diet is so good for us. Well, I think one of the great gifts of the last couple of years has been um, everything bagel seasoning. Um, and I, I have decided that I'm going to put it on almost everything. It's, you know, it's the new ketchup, I guess. Um, so, uh, so you need to try the, re you need to try the recipe in my cookbook for my everything bagel chicken wings. 
And so you basically put the chicken wings on top of the steam rack, on top of the water at the bottom, and then you just kind of steam them. Then you dump those chicken wings on a baking sheet, cover them with barbecue sauce and everything, bagel spice, and you broil them five minutes aside. And it's pr definitely one of my, among my kind of top five favorite recipes in the book. Um, so I love everything bagel spice as well. One of my other favorite recipes is I have a recipe for a spaghetti with flanken bolognese. Now Jewish people eat American food basically, kind of Monday to Friday, like everyone else does. I would say Sunday to Friday. We're barbecuing on Sundays. We're making what everybody else in America is eating. But on Shabbat and holidays, we really like to bring our kind of traditional foods in. And the spaghetti recipe is great because you cook up the sauce at the bottom of the pot. And then you add the spaghetti, sauce, and water, and you close the lid. So the sauce, the pasta, cook at the same time. And when the recipe is done, you're just tossing it together. So there's no colander. There's no one pot for the pasta and one pot for the sauce. It's your entire meal is inside your inner pot. You're, you're known as the kosher baker as well. Um, in this new book, uh, what recipes do you have uh, that we might have an interest in in the area of baking? Well, Instant Pot Cheesecake is great. I have two meat and one dairy Instant Pot. So not everybody has a dairy one, but flourish chocolate cake, molten like lava cakes are really great. You kind of bake them in either ramekins or little fluted pans. And those are really delicious. Lava cakes are so great because you can make them, have them in the fridge, and when you're ready to bake them, you just kind of stick them in the Instant Pot and they cook really fast. Um, I also have a honey cake for Rosh Hashanah and a sponge cake for Passover. And then I have a couple of dairy ones like flan and rice pudding and pot creme. So I definitely enjoy making those recipes in the Instant Pot. They come out so, certain things just come out so creamy, even fish has like a buttery texture in the Instant Pot that I don't quite get if I'm roasting it in the oven. You're, um, you've been out on the road virtually uh, and you do the cooking classes. For people who have your books and who follow you, um, what are their favorites? What do you hear from, from those folks who say, you know, I, I never knew I could do this or uh, this was a terrific recipe. I tried it and the family is really excited about it. What are the recipes that people come back to you uh, with and say, just worked for me? So, you know, what some are expected, were expected to be hits and some surprised me. So one that I expected was my lentil dal and rice. They were talking about, you know, kind of Indian influenced food. So this is like what we call pot and pot cooking. So I make a, a dal, a, a Indian stew at the bottom of the pot with red lentils. I put the I squish the steam rack on top of it. And then I take a pan, like a six inch round baking pan. I put in rice and water and then you seal off the top and then the stew and the rice cook at the same time. So you have your entire meal ready inside the pot pretty quickly. So that one's been very popular. One that surprised me that I'm getting so much feedback from, which really warms my heart, is the Swedish meatballs and so many Jewish families have versions of sweet and sour meatballs. In my family, this was my grandma Sylvia's recipe. It's Heinz like chili sauce and grape jelly. My father didn't cook much, but he made grape jelly out of the grapes we grew in our garden, two blocks from the beach in Long Beach, New York. I still have two, he's gone, but I still have two jars of the jelly in my cabinet that I just, I can't bring myself to eat just yet. And people have loved these meatballs. I keep getting messages that people are making them like on regular rotation. And um, I guess, you know, it's one of those recipes that represents my own personal food story. You know, and I always say that when people are planning meals, they should combine kind of old and new at the table. They should have a recipe from their past that tells their own food story, something they grew up with, someplace they traveled to, a meal they remember serving their children or ate off campus when they had their first apartment. And like bring that to the table and then take a new recipe from me, from any one of my books and create like a new tradition. So you combine the old and new together. So I've been really happy about that recipe. You know, other ones people like is one of the recipes that's on the cover of the book. It's my beet and quinoa salad. You basically put quinoa, water and cubed beets in the pot at the same time. So the beet cooks at the same time as the quinoa and you end up with this beautiful pink base of a 
kind of room temperature side dish and you add walnuts and parsley to that. It's based on a recipe I tasted in Haifa a couple of years ago. And that one also has been one that people really like because it goes with everything. It's a vegan main course. It goes with barbecue, it goes with fish. So it's, and it's so pretty and it's just so perfect for summertime. As I mentioned earlier, and as we, we all know, everyone is cooking more in the past 16 months. Uh, they're home, now they're going out. Uh, but many people are cooking more than perhaps ever before. Have, have you learned any new cooking skills? And you've talked about it, but you've had the time, even though you're doing the cooking classes and you've the book tour, writing this book, um, have you learned any, any skills just by experimentation? Anything that just kind of, wow, I didn't know I could do that or I didn't know that would happen if I did put these ingredients together? Any, any aha moments, I guess we would call it? Well, one was from was from my son Joey, who is a master fermenter and a, he's an engineering student and he's like a scientist in the kitchen. He forced me to order a, a digital thermometer and that has really changed. It's a game changer. That was like a big aha moment for chicken and for steak, just sticking a thermometer in and knowing the range of, you know, kind of medium rare, rare cooked cook ch ch chicken. I don't have to cut into things anymore. So to me, that was just incredible. Um, so that was definitely kind of one general cooking skill that I highly recommend to everyone just to, to get themselves a scale, a digital thermometer to really kind of perfect their chicken and their beef recipes. Um, other aha moments. Um, I think the kawa focaccia was definitely one of my ideas that I couldn't get over was so great. And, um, and just really learning how to, how to perfect bread. And it's just, you know, it's like I tell all my students, my virtual students all the time, like no one is born a Michelin chef. It's all about practice. So, so many things just got so much easier to me because I did them over and over. But the other thing that I really learned is since I was using other people's recipes was to trust your judgment. I know the recipe says saute these onions for five minutes, but if after three minutes they look golden to you, then you're ready for the next step of the recipe that I don't, I, you know, I always say follow my recipes perfectly the first time, but I, I really want people to feel empowered when they cook to trust themselves that they, they have a feel, they have a sense of like how things should look. So that was something, another thing that I learned was to, even as a recipe writer to not be so wedded to what the recipe said. You know, one of the things that I discovered teaching cooking classes and watching how people cook is that there's so many skills people don't have in the kitchen. Things that are obvious to me, like how to peel a carrot, how to chop onions, not everybody knows intuitively. And that I'm not just talking about teenagers, I'm talking about older students as well. I did, a, and, I, and I'm still doing private Zoom cooking classes for people's birthdays and celebrations, bat mitzvahs, and um, watching what people are doing kind of shows me what people know and what people don't. No, you mentioned bread making, and it seems uh, just from my own observations that, that there are a lot of people who are kind of, you know, standoffish because they feel that this is a major project uh, of baking bread. Yet there's a lot of interest in bread making. Uh, and I would imagine through the course of the pandemic with people having a little more time, uh, thinking that making bread takes time, um, perhaps more people are, are now into, into bread making. Tell us about, about that and um, how one can feel confident uh, about uh, attempting to bake bread. I think one of the reasons why bread making is so popular, you, you mentioned it's because people definitely had more time and there was an explosion of people baking challah, which was really wonderful for me to see. But there's something about the process of like making bread and taking the most simplest of ingredients and watching them transform and then rise. I think during a year that was so difficult, it represented hope for people, that idea that things can change, things can grow, things can, you can take, start at one place and end up someplace wonderful. And the thing about bread baby breaking people are always afraid of is they, they think it takes so much time, but each step is not time consuming. Even sourdough, sourdough may take a day and a half once you have your starter. But each step takes minutes. You're lifting and stretching a dough. You're folding it. I mean, you're not standing in the kitchen for hours like you are for like Passover and Rosh Hashanah. You're walking into the kitchen. You're folding your dough. You walk away for half an hour. 
shaping it takes also minutes. It's just that like if you're home, it's something to kind of weave into the kind of the time of your day. So I think that people shouldn't be afraid to do it. And, you know, there's so many videos online. There's so many ways to do it. But I feel like you bread making now, the resources are out there. And it's one of those things like the first time you'll make a recipe, it may not come out exactly the way you want it. Like, you know, bake it, see which temperatures, temperatures work for you. Your oven may be hotter. I can't bake my sourdough breads at the recipe that the cookbook I follow recommends because it burns the bottom of my bread every time. So now I've learned to lower the temperature. So like I mentioned before, trust yourself. But, you know, for challah especially, like challah dough is done mixing and kneading when you touch the top of the dough and pan glides across the top of it. Even if the recipe said it's supposed to have another quarter cup of flour, you're done adding it. Like if the, if the dough is soft, you are done. So I prefer recipes that give you the visuals and tell you what you're looking for, not just add this or do this. Just to, um, to go back to the pandemic for a second, in, in those first uh, couple of weeks uh, when everybody was going to the supermarket and finding the shelves bare, uh, we, we found that there were many things that we couldn't get. Um, and I think it, it caused a lot of people to start thinking about food and, and the importance of food and the meaning uh, of food. Um, how can people bring more meaning to the table through, through cooking and through the food that they eat? So I think, first of all, I st even though I'm back going to supermarkets over the last month or two, I have such an overwhelming sense of gratitude for ingredients. After going through that initial period where we couldn't get things, being able to go and pick my own food, being able to get everything, I I'm just so appreciative of every ingredient in my house. And I even developed strategies for extending the life of fresh herbs. We would all zest the citrus before juicing it to just get more life out of every vegetable and to waste less. So that's kind of one way to kind of honor our food. And the other way to add meaning is, is what I mentioned before, which is like bringing your food story to the table. And even if it's just you kind of enjoying that memory, like really enjoy that memory of what you're eating, but Take the chance, take the opportunity to share with the people at your table, now that we can have people together again, you know, why certain dishes are important to you, why they trigger certain memories. Like, you know, so many families create family cookbooks. I've edited several for people. And they do this because if you don't put these recipes down on paper and make the recipes while everyone is still alive, then something gets missed. And I think we really have to be deliberate about honoring our food story because otherwise it will get lost. You know, you, you have to keep bringing it to the next generation. I used to make themed Shabbat dinners for years, Japanese Shabbat dinner, French Shabbat dinner. And then I realized, wait a second, I need to bring in some traditional recipes for Shabbat and all the Jewish holidays. So for the rest of my kids' lives, when they eat a brisket, it's going to take them right back to Rosh Hashanah. When they eat certain kinds of side dishes or family recipes or stuffed cabbage, it'll bring them back to a certain place in time. I mean, food, the recipes we choose and honoring those memories, it's a way to connect with people who were gone. You know, I have my grandmother, who was my great food influence in my life, has influenced recipes in every one of my five cookbooks. So I'm always going back to kind of her recipes and my kids know all those recipes from her, her blintzes, which I made just on Shavuot and, you know, can really honor someone's memory and connect you with somebody who's gone. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think that um, there is a fact of, of a, this being kind of a conveyor belt. It's a legacy issue um, and food to, to all people, but um, everyone has their own special uh, cuisine. Um, and we eat Jewish food, but it's also very much part of, of our history. Those of us who, who have antecedents in Eastern Europe know about the importance of potatoes in, in one's uh, diet. Just hearing about, uh, you know, borscht. My father was a big fan of borscht. He came from Russia. Those kinds of experiences with food are as much an eating experience 
as they are uh, an ethnic experience and uh, the history of our people experience. Oh, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. So, you know, you know, what I did in this book, which I've done in all my books is bridge generations. But if you think about the Jewish people who came from Northern Africa and Eastern Europe came to America, they had recipes in their head and they had to find the equipment, the tool, the, in the ingredients to try to recreate those recipes. I did the same thing in the Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook. I took you know, our traditional recipes, plus a lot of trendy international, et cetera, recipes, but I adapted them to a new device. So what I've done is just a continuum, a continuum of what Jewish people as immigrants have done for generations. What I love most about Instant Pot cooking is that for the most part, it really creates comfort food, which I think over the last year plus, we need now more than ever. And I always say that like the Instant Pot creates the kind of food that we can share to comfort and uplift people because lots of soups and stews, you can just pack up in a container and bring them to someone. Just uh, to close, we talked about all the importance of Jewish food and what we've just uh, said now about how important it is to, to our own identity. Uh, but do you find that Jewish food, which has always had a certain appeal in terms of, of bagels and blintzes and, and, and beyond the Jewish community, that there is more interest now, especially with Israeli food uh, becoming very popular, that there is more interest, generally speaking, uh, about uh, Jewish cooking? I th But that's a trend that's been happening for, I don't know, maybe about seven years already. Jewish jellies were opening around the country, whether they were kosher or not, that was happening everywhere. I think that babka has become extremely popular on Instagram and all of social media, rugalak as well, people making their own homemade bagels. So, and, and this goes in, this is in the general food world. It's not just limited to like the Jewish food blogging community. I think that there's something really kind of satisfying about, you know, bread and chocolate and, and bread and challah bread and, and our soups and stews. Those are, kind, you know, are really the kind of foods that nourish us. And I think that's the appeal of some of these recipes. And they're not necessarily that complicated and they're made with basic ingredients that you can find everywhere. You know, like you said, like the potatoes and the beets and the, and the, um, and the eggs and the, you know, the, the lemons, all the apples, all of that are very easy to find and they're not crazy expensive ingredients to, to cook from. Well, we're having this discussion actually an hour before lunchtime. So I'll, I'm already thinking about uh, what I'm going to have for lunch. Uh, the book is the Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook, 100 Recipes to Nourish Body and Soul by Paula Scheuer and is available in store or online wherever you purchase books. Paula, thank you for being with us today and speaking with us about your new Instant Pot Kosher Cookbook. We really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dan. It was fun for me too. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content and you enjoyed this program, visit our website, benebrith.org, to listen to all of our conversations, our podcasts, and our live interviews. Thanks to author, chef, and kosher cooking expert, Paula Scheuer, for joining me. And thank you for listening. Well, if you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm your host, Dan Mariashin. Talk to you again soon.